Good morning. Welcome to Graham Christian Reformed Church on this last Sunday of September. We seems like we raced through the month, but here we are in God's house once again on another Sunday, and it's good to be gathered as God's people. For those visiting, we're glad that you could join us this day, and we pray together that we may be lifted up into God's presence, that we may draw nearer and nearer to our God as we worship Him. And for those watching a recording, welcome to you as well. We're glad you could join us in that way. I'd like to read from Psalm 71 as our call to worship, beginning at verse 19. Your righteousness reaches to the skies, O God, you who have done great things. Who, O God, is like you? Though you have made me see troubles, many and bitter, you will restore my life again. From the depths of the earth you will again bring me up. You will increase my honor and comfort me once again. I will praise you with the harp for your faithfulness, O my God. I will sing praise to you with the lyre, O Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praise to you, I who you have redeemed. My tongue will tell of your righteous acts all day long, for those who wanted to harm me have been put to shame and confusion. It's God who calls us to this place, calls us into his presence that we might worship him. He is the God who puts it on our hearts to want to praise Him, want to worship Him, and want to know Him. And We gather to do that, to worship, to know, and to praise our God, to celebrate His love for us, to remember that without Him we are nothing, we are dead, unless God makes us alive through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand together when the music plays and we'll sing our opening song, We Praise You, O God. of God, our help is in the name of the Lord, the one who has created the heavens and the earth. Receive a greeting from him. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing, O praise the Lord, for it is good.
we look at the letter that James wrote to the early church, he reminds us of the fact that as Christians who have faith in Jesus Christ, we're called to do good deeds. We are called to show our faith through those good deeds. We're now going to turn to Romans chapter 7, where we're reminded by Paul, ultimately by God, that it is hard to choose to do good. And even when our mind and heart say, yes, I will do good, there's often something in our path, the devil puts in our path, a temptation perhaps, that quickly changes us off course and we end up doing the bad we do not want to do and we don't do the good we ought to do. So hear these words from Romans 7 as a call to confession. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through our Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Towards the end of those verses, Paul says, Thank you to God, for through Jesus Christ we are saved and rescued from our body of death. And yet in the next line he says, he reminds himself that in his mind he may be a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, which we all need to contend with until Jesus calls us home or returns, he, he and Paul and all of us are still a slave to the law of sin, where we know that we fall short of living how God wants us to do. <clears throat> with these profound words in our ears and in our minds, let's now come to God in prayer. Or Let's first sing a, a song of invitation where we invite one another and ourselves to come before God and confess our sins. We're going to sing just as I am. You can remain seated as we sing this song of invitation.
Let's turn our hearts to God and come before Him in a prayer of confession. Let's pray. Loving God, we come to You in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank You, Lord God, for sending Jesus Christ, who is the one, the only one who can rescue us from our bodies of death, the only one who can rescue us from the sinful nature that still resides in each one of us. We thank You that through faith in Christ we are justified, we are seen by You as righteous and holy, and we thank You, Holy Spirit, that through faith in Christ You have put us on the path of sanctification, the journey of renewal. That journey is a constant fight, and some days, Lord, we, we lose the battle, we give in to the sinful nature, we turn away from You in Your ways, we don't follow Your will, but follow our own will. And Lord, we ask that you would forgive us. We know that we stand forgiven in Christ, and so we pray, help us to know in our hearts that we are forgiven, not to listen to the evil one who rubs it in our face that we can't follow the pattern of Christ as we ought to. We feel it, his convicting voice, Lord, condemning voice that perhaps we aren't saved after all because of the sins that we still commit. And so, Holy Spirit, shut out the voice of the evil one and let us hear your voice, your voice alone, reminding us that in Christ we are indeed forgiven. We are washed clean through the blood of Christ and that one day we will be made perfectly whole. We will no longer contend with our sinful nature. So help us, Lord, to turn away from all that keeps us from you. As your people, help us to be united in one goal, one faith, one Lord Jesus Christ, and to live for Him in all that we do. So hear our prayers, for we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's recite together words of question and answer 91 of the Heidelberg Catechism. As I said earlier, James is highlighting the need for us to do good in connection with our faith. And question and answer 91 talks about this good. I'll read the question. Together, let's read the answer. What do we do that is good? Only that which arises out of true faith, conforms to God's law, and is done for His glory, and not that which is based on what we think is right or on established human tradition. We're going to look at that human tradition, human wisdom, in just a few moments when we turn back to James's letter and compare what is true wisdom and what is false wisdom as we seek to live for Christ in all that we do. Now let's stand together and sing, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. And the Sunday school kids up to grade one can come down to the front at the end of that song.
there's my brave souls who made it to the front. Good to see you, girls and boy. Good to have you here. And any kids who didn't want to come to the front, you can join them on the way out, of course. It's good to see you again. You're happy to go to Sunday school? <clears throat> Maybe you want to stay in the sanctuary. Soon you will. And you'll grow up really fast, and you'll be in here with the rest of us. You guys are going to go off to Sunday school, and you do the same thing that we do here. You're going to study God's Word, the Bible, and we're going to do the same thing. So you're not missing out. You're just probably going to study something a little different than we are. All right? But don't, don't think you're missing out. But before you go, let's pray. It's always good to pray and ask for the Lord's blessing before we study His Word, or else they're just words on a page, right? But if we ask God to help us understand, then He will open our minds and our hearts to receive His Word, which is always about Jesus Christ, right? Our Savior and Lord. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for the Bible, which tells us the wonderful story of how you are saving us and redeeming us in Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your willingness to come to earth, to take on a human body like ours, and to live the life that we live. And we thank you that you stayed sinless, that you did not uh, commit sin, you didn't disobey God the Father, you didn't disobey God's Word. And because of your accomplishment, because you were perfect, when we look to you in faith and trust, then your perfection is ours. We thank you for that wonderful gospel message. And as we study your word now, we pray, Lord, whether here in the sanctuary or in the Sunday school rooms, that you would open our minds to receive your word, to know your love that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, now you can stand up and face the people. You remember the blessing? We say, the Lord be with you, and then you guys say, and also with you. All right, let's bless the children saying, the Lord be with you. <laughs> Thanks, Owen. You're, you had some, you guys can go, yeah, you guys can go. You had some help, but it was just quiet help. All right, off you guys. <laughs> Girls go to Sunday school. Follow Owen, he's a good leader. And those of us here in the sanctuary, those watching, I invite you to turn to James, chapter 3, <clears throat> page 1883 in the Pew Bible, 1883. And for those watching, we use the 1984 edition of the New International Version, if you want to follow the exact one that we'll be reading. And we're going to back up a little bit than what it says in the bulletin. We're not going to start at 13. We're going to start at verse 9, and we'll read through to the end of the chapter. Our Bible puts a title at verse 13. It's a break there, but James would not have done that. He would have been writing one letter without numbers and verses and titles. So we'll begin at verse 9. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. 
peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So last week we looked at James's warnings in the first part of chapter 3 about our speech and how as Christians we need to be in control of the words that are coming out of our mouths. But James says the reality is that we don't always control our tongues. He says, as we just read, that we praise God in one breath and curse others and even God himself in the next. When it comes to our speech, it's like we have split personalities. Some unplanned or intense emotional situation arises and we fly off the handle. We're kind of like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde for those of us who are old enough to remember that illustration. We are at times double-minded and unstable as James taught us in chapter 1 verse 8. So what makes us able to control our speech, our words in one moment And then in the next moment, we sound like a foul-mouthed, hardened sailor or street fighter. Well, Jesus taught us that what comes off our tongues is an overflow of what's in our hearts. So whatever our mouths are saying in the moment indicates our heart condition at that moment. And what lives in our hearts is both good and evil. We just read and we just prayed about Romans 7 where Paul echoes James in stating the reality that we are conflicted beings. We are double-minded and we are double-hearted creatures at times. We profess faith in Jesus Christ and we may try to do our best in terms of having a Christ-like behavior and speech. We may desperately want to do the good that we ought to do, as Paul says, but then bam, without thinking we're doing, we're saying the bad that we ought not to do. We prayed our prayer of confession earlier, asking the Lord to forgive us for not doing the good we ought to do and doing the bad that we ought not to do. And if we're genuinely sorry for our sins, our merciful Lord and Savior, He does indeed forgive us. And it's in gratitude for that forgiveness that we need to keep working, and working hard to become more Christ-like in our actions, in our thoughts, our words. Often, our bad behavior And bad language, it's a result of being lazy. We know we have bad habits, and yet we don't work to overcome those bad habits. Even worse, we make allowances, we make excuses for our bad behavior and bad language. We say things to ourselves and to others, oh, that's just who I am. Or, I just have a mechanic's mouth. That's my personal example for those who know me, by the way. So I'm preaching this sermon to myself as much as anyone here. Or we make excuses for other people's bad behavior. We say things along the lines, oh, that's just so and so. We expect that behavior and language from them. But making excuses for bad behavior, it's spiritual laziness. And this laziness is an unwillingness to change how we live. There's no valid excuse for bad behavior and out of control tongues. A lack of willpower, that's not an excuse either. We simply can't excuse being double-minded, double-hearted, two-faced Christians. As James says, brothers and sisters, praising and cursing out of the same mouth, it must not happen. And so we need to evaluate the source of where our behavior and our language and speech originates. And as Jesus reminds us, that our source is the heart. What's in our hearts and minds leads us to how we act. And as, again, as we discussed last week, the, we all need Jesus, and we, more, we need more of Jesus in our hearts and minds. And I picked that song, the last song, on purpose because we need the mind of Christ in us so that we will be more like Christ. And if we have the heart of Christ, then we will be more like Christ as well. Simply put, if we have more of Jesus in our lives, we will be more like Jesus in how we live. And that leads us to today's passage in this second part of James chapter 3. James gets at having proper wisdom in order to live the proper way. So yeah, he's moving from speech to wisdom in this chapter, but he's not really introducing a new topic or a new idea. 
because the topic for James in this letter is always proper Christian living as followers of Jesus Christ. And for Christians to have proper speech, it requires us to have proper wisdom. Christ's wisdom, that must be the source, the wellspring that feeds our hearts and minds. Christ's wisdom must be the source and the wellspring that guides our thoughts, our actions, our tongues. In verse 13, James asks the question, who is wise among you? You know, well, he immediately gives the answer. He states who is wise. He says, the wise person is one who shows by their deeds a good life. Perhaps you hear echoes of what James said about faith and deeds back in chapter 2. There he said that true faith in Jesus Christ will show through deeds of mercy and love for our neighbors. True faith will be proven by corresponding actions. The same is true for wisdom. If we have the correct wisdom, it'll be proven by a good life. And here, the good life doesn't mean what it means today. For today, a good life means a life of easiness, a life of comfort, a life of self-fulfillment. And usually having wealth is what our world says leads to a good life. No, a good life for James means a moral and righteous life a life following God's will. And so the true good life for the Christian is a life that's lived in the pattern of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only pure and true example of a life of humility that comes from the proper kind of wisdom. And that's why the truly wise Christian is one who shows deeds that are done in humility. But for us to do these Christ-like deeds of humility, it requires a certain kind of wisdom. And James expands on that in verse 17, what true wisdom is. And we'll get to that in a moment. But first, in, chapter, in verse 15, James begins explaining what the opposite of true Christ-like wisdom is. And he gets to the heart of bad wisdom by going to the heart. He says, if our hearts harbor envy and selfish ambition, then we won't act wisely. When our hearts propel us, and motivate us to get ahead of others, then we will behave and we'll speak poorly. And why is that? Because if we are the center of our heart's attention, we tend to believe that we are the best and most important. Envy or jealousy and selfish ambition, they make us believe that then we deserve the best if we're number one. And so self-promotion, self-aggrandizement, it leads us to becoming a god unto ourselves. If we are number one in our lives, then we will put God and others down. We won't love God and neighbor when our hearts are filled with jealousy, envy, and selfish ambition. It's a trick that Satan plays on us to think that we are number one. It's his, actually his number one temptation and trick. We know that this is the devil's number one method of tripping us up because it's the first temptation, the first trick, that he successfully used against humans. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden, back to Adam and Eve. What did Satan convince Adam and Eve of? That they could be like God. He set the trap that they could potentially take God's place. They began to envy God's status. They had a selfish ambition to become like God. They fell for Satan's lie headfirst. They ate that forbidden fruit because they wanted to be number one in their own lives. They thought, they believed that they could do God's job. But they found out that no humans, none of us, are God. We can't be God. We can't do God's job. We aren't wise like God. In fact, we're not even wise enough to outsmart Satan. We are easily easy prey for him. Human wisdom says... I am my own master. Worldly wisdom makes us believe that I am the master of my own destiny. Earthly wisdom makes us believe that we can be God and that we can take his place. James says all that so-called wisdom, it's not wisdom at all. Such wisdom, James says, is not from heaven. It's not from God. It is earthly, spiritual, and of the devil thinking. James declares in verse 15. Having a heart that 
harbors envy and selfish ambition, it is 100% not being like Jesus Christ. Jealousy, selfish motivations, these are demonic and these are satanic urges within us. As I just pointed out, this started way back in the Garden of Eden because of Satan and his tricks. Envy and selfish ambition are the source of disorder in every evil practice, James says. And he's right, of course. Creation before sin is all about God's order, God's righteousness, God's perfection built into his creation. Enter Satan and human sin into the creation of order. And what we've had ever since is disorder and chaos, sin and every evil practice, in short, depravity. Envy and selfish ambition, they're related to the deadly sin identified as pride. Pride is the original sin. Pride is to puff oneself up. Pride is the love of self. And it's the opposite of loving God and neighbor. Worldly wisdom harms others. It wrecks relationships. It frustrates fellowships. And it fouls the peace and the unity that the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to have. There's no true wisdom in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. When humans behave like animals, we destroy other people. When humans prey on one another, we destroy the fabric of human society that God built into the original creation. When humans adopt a survival of the fittest mentality, then we begin to destroy our made in God's image likeness that's in us and in those around us. And so when we're boasting about being wise, when we're actually harming others, it's a lie, it's a denial of the truth. When we adopt worldly, demonic thinking, we in essence become little devils. And the world we live in is full of devils. Martin Luther knew this when he wrote the song, A Mighty Fortress. Verse 3 begins, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us. Martin Luther knew that Christians are in a spiritual war. He knew that our enemy is Satan. But he also knows that those under Satan's power are agents of the devil too. Christians must not live like devils following earthly wisdom. Christians need to turn to Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ is God's weapon given to defeat evil and sin. We Christians must seek true wisdom. And James identifies what and where this true wisdom is and where it comes from. Verse 17, he says, the wisdom that comes down from heaven, that's what we each need. True wisdom comes from God, the Father who is in heaven. And wisdom is available as God's gift to all who ask for it. James taught that way back in chapter 1. God is the source of good. And he offers us his wisdom, his perfect goodness. For God is the source of true wisdom. He designed how we should all live life. And so it only makes sense then that we look to God for guidance in living. And yet we don't. Remember Romans 7 that we just read. Just like our first parents, Adam and Eve, we don't live according to the will of God, according to the wisdom of God. So God made a plan way back in Genesis that he would provide not just a knowledge of pure wisdom, which we find in his word and he puts it on our hearts. He didn't just describe how we ought to live out his pure wisdom. No, God came to earth. He showed us how exactly to live lives of wisdom. When God the Son came and he took on flesh, when the Word of God became human in Christ Jesus, it's in Christ Jesus that we see perfect wisdom lived out. James describes this life of perfect wisdom. He says it's a life marked by purity. To be pure, according to the Bible, is to align with God's truth, to align with his righteousness, to seek it, Purity is the opposite of evil. And so a pure wisdom is one, is a wisdom that is marked by peace, consideration, submission, mercy, good fruit, impartiality, and sincerity, James says. 
A pure wisdom life is one where other people matter more than self. And it's Jesus who lived out the pure wisdom life, and he did it perfectly. Jesus is our example. Now, it's true, James doesn't say in his letter, live like Jesus. He's only mentioned Jesus twice by name so far in this letter. He identified himself as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he says he's writing to believers in our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's safe to assume that James sees Jesus as our example of Christian living. And he has the teachings of Jesus in his mind as he's writing this letter. He says, Christians are peacemakers who sow in peace and raise a harvest of righteousness. Verse 18. There's no doubt that James has Jesus' sermon on the mount in his mind. You remember Jesus' sermon? He said, blessed are the meek. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He said, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. And blessed are the peacemakers. The people that Jesus pointed out that I just recited for us, these are the kind of people that James is telling Christians they ought to be. These are the kind of people that Jesus wants us to be. For these are Jesus' people. Jesus' earthly life was a life of perfect goodness, perfect humility. He was meek. He was a man who lived and breathed righteousness. He was merciful. He was pure in heart. He was a peacemaker. And Philippians 2, the letter that Paul writes, echoes James's teaching on wisdom and connecting that wisdom to Christ's example. Paul writes, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Jesus' way of life is the wise life, the life of true wisdom. The Bible actually declares this about Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 24. To those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. To those that God gives faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ is and must be our wisdom that comes from heaven. Now the world will look down on this wisdom because the world is not peace-loving, it's not considerate, it's not submissive, it's not full of mercy or good fruit, it's not impartial and it's not sincere. The world hates all those things and that's because the world is caught in Satan's trap and lie about finding the good life through self-serve living. Ultimately, the world hates Jesus Christ And it hates Christ's way of the cross. A man dying on a cross to save sinners, it's absolute foolishness to the perishing world around us. But through Jesus Christ dying on a cross, God has destroyed the false wisdom of the world. Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection, it has destroyed Satan's lie and his schemes. The life of Christ Jesus displays God's wisdom and his power to renew what is broken by sin, and that's each one of us. True life and new life. It's found only in Jesus Christ, who is God's wisdom, shown in and through the way he lived, his life of humility. In mercy and grace, God saves us from doom and destruction. And because God rescues us from sin through faith in the Lord Jesus, Our only boast cannot be in ourselves. For James says, we are not to boast about our hearts that are full of envy and selfish ambition. We ought to know that we are dead in and of ourselves. And so our only boast can be in the one who can save us. And that is Jesus Christ and him alone. And so this life of true wisdom, that is a life that rests in Jesus Christ, who is God's wisdom personified. The true life of wisdom is the one that we live in the pattern 
of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we turn to you seeking that you would help us to become more like Jesus. That we would seek your wisdom. As James said back in chapter 1, if we just ask and believe that you will give us that wisdom, you will offer it and build it into our lives. And so we pray, give us the wisdom that comes from heaven, from you. Give us the wisdom who is Jesus Christ. Fill our lives with his presence. Fill our lives with a desire to live like him so that we will be peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, that we will be impartial with the good news of Jesus Christ, with the truth, that we will be sincere in how we live out our faith in Jesus. For if we call Christ our Lord, we need to show that by how we live. And if we claim to have true wisdom, that too must be shown by how we live. Lives of humble service to you, Lord God, and to others, that is the path, the journey that you set us on when you give us faith in Christ. And we don't do this to earn favor from you, because you have shown your favor to us long before we even recognized it. For when we were sinners, you called us to faith in Christ. And so out of gratitude for that new life that's available in Christ, that new life that you are indeed building within us, help us to go forth, not making excuses for sin, but to work hard to live like Jesus, as tribute to him, as praise to you, Lord God, as an act of worship. And may we do this in every part of our lives. We pray this through the power of the Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. As our song of response, let's stand together when the music plays and let's sing, Lord, speak to me that I may speak.
Let's bow our heads and come to God in a time of prayer, our congregational prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your wonderful truth that you sent Jesus Christ into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might through him be saved. We thank you that all who believe in Jesus are delivered from the power of sin and death, that all who believe in Jesus and live out that faith truly become heirs with him of eternal life. We become your children. and We thank you for that, Lord, for the love that you put in our lives that makes us children, children of God, the Creator, and our Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we pray for the one holy church of Jesus Christ that exists throughout the world. We pray that you would grant your church much, much unity in its witness and its service, for we believe and, and serve one Lord, who is Jesus Christ. Lord God, will you strengthen the church in faith, increase it in it love for you and for others, and preserve your church, Lord, in peace, all these things that are found in Jesus Christ alone. We pray that for the worldwide church. We pray it for our church here, our, de our denomination, our congregation, Lord, whatever fellowship we belong to. Lord, may it be a fellowship that worships Jesus Christ in truth and in spirit. Lord, we pray for all those who have not received the gospel of Jesus Christ, for all who have heard but have not accepted your words of life. We pray for all who have not heard the words of salvation. We pray for all those whose faith has waned we pray for those, Lord, whose sin has made them indifferent to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for all who, have actively, who do actively oppose Christ by word and deed. We pray for all those who are enemies of the cross of Christ, who are persecutors of your people. And we pray for all who are following false wisdom and who have, in the name of Jesus Christ, even persecuted other people on some religious crusade that they think they need to be on. Lord Jesus, you call us to use love as our weapon. We are called to use your love to reach other people, even our enemies. Help us, Lord, to do that. And in this prayer, we pray for all, friend and foe, that they would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord, that they may find true peace that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord God, open the hearts of all those who need to hear your truth. Lead them to faith and to obedience. And help us, Lord, who have faith to become more obedient in our walk. Merciful God, you are the creator of all the peoples of the earth. Have compassion on all those who do not know you, as you are revealed and as you have revealed yourself in Jesus Christ. We pray for our world and chaotic state that it's in. We pray that you would guide world leaders to seek your wisdom and truth. Lord, convict them if they need to be convicted of their envious hearts and their selfish ambitions. We pray, turn all those who are in power, turn them to Jesus Christ. Let them fall down on their knees before his throne and confess that Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Let your gospel be preached with grace and with power to those throughout the world, Lord. Let the light of Jesus Christ shine in the darkness. Again, we pray, turn all the hearts of those who resist him and resist the gospel. Bring them home to your fold, any who have gone astray. For we are one flock under the one great shepherd, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you'd be near those who are struggling in life from sickness from sorrow, from grief, uncertainty, fear, those plagued with loneliness and desperation. Lord, those who are feeling life has a great weight on them, that they are weighed down by the chaos and the uncertainty of this world. 
this world that groans still under the weight of sin, the curse. Lord, you are the one who will lift that curse, for you are the one who has cursed your creation because of our sin. We can't fix this world, despite what green crusaders may say. Only Jesus can fix what is broken. And he's done that. He's provided the path for that through himself. And we need to keep our eyes focused on him and tell the world about him. For he is the true and only fix for all that is broken. So immerse all of us in your unfailing love. And be with those, Lord, who need an extra measure of that love and your comfort this day. We thank you, Lord, that Ed is healing, that he had that operation, he's home, and he's beginning that journey of healing. We thank you, Lord, that his pain is manageable. We pray, Lord, that the whole process of healing may um, go well and that you will heal him completely. Lord, we pray for others. We don't mention by name, we pray for our seniors those who are shut in their homes and care homes, Lord, for whatever reason, they can't get out, they aren't able to travel or get around easily on their own. Be near them, Lord. Let them know that they are not abandoned, that you are with them, that you will never leave them or forsake them. Lord, we pray for those who suffer in silence. Be near them. Let them know that you hear them, Lord. We pray for those who are beginning new stages of life. We pray for the moms among us in our families who are pregnant. We pray that those pregnancies may go well and come to term, full term, and a healthy baby may come into this world, Lord. Prepare the parents for that momentous change in their lives. We thank you for the gift of life. We see it through the birth of babies. We are reminded of that each day we have, or each year we have a birthday. May we not take life for granted, but may we, who have been given new life in Christ, be champions of life. Of course, this life now and in the life to come, may we uphold your will, your great plan. May we, may we be faithful in carrying it out. Lord, hear all our prayers. Or we lift them up in the name of Jesus for your honor and for your glory. We pray, answer them. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we'll invite the deacons forward and we'll collect our offering, which is for the general fund, the, uh, the running of our church and the ministries that we support through, uh, through our, our congregation here. Dear Lord, you have given us so much, we are grateful to, be, grateful to be able to give a portion back to you. Please bless 
our offering for the general fund of our church as we use it to further your kingdom and funding the day-to-day -day operation of your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Following the service, you're all invited to a time of fellowship and also our monthly soup and bun lunch. So do stay if you're able for that. It's always an enjoyable meal that we share together. Receive now God's parting benediction. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and hope, may our God encourage you, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word to his honor, praise, and glory. Amen. We sing, God of mercy, God of grace.